Right guys, Jack here at JBF Music and Guitar Lessons and what I've got for you today is the analysis portion to my kind of reaction from the bandmates clang. I need to just like write a, a script to get a much smoother way to say that because I always botch that intro. A anyway, I was nudged towards this one by Rabbi Rabs and on that note, a huge shout out to yourself, Rabbi Rabs, Matt Hartsman, Glenn Kelly, Stephen Williams and Rebecca Hay for the continued support on Patreon. I appreciate it so much guys. But uh, sent me the song and said you could check it out and I, I mentioned Paul Gilbert a lot and he said they'd gone and kind of looked at him and checked out one of Paul's songs, Scarified, and that it'd be interesting to do a kind of comparison of the two. And there are a lot of similarities. And ones I wouldn't necessarily have drawn myself, which I always find interesting. I think it's cool. I just I just find it fascinating because there'll be stuff in the comments you guys will be like, oh it sounds a bit like this or it sounds a bit like this. A lot of time it's just on the money. I, I totally get where you're coming from. And while it's not necessarily a connection that I would immediately think of, I, I just think it's fascinating how our brains kind of almost like, you know those <laughs> like police boards you get or the kind of uh, always sunny when Charlie's going mad with his conspiracy theories. <laughs> it's a bit like that, a conspiracy theory for music. Where you hear something and you're like oh it kind of reminds me of this thing here i just find it really cool how it all kind of i don't know interweaves together but i, I would not surprise me in the slightest if this is a kind of tribute to uh, scarified or indeed paul gilbert because there's quite a lot of paul gilbert isms in the song and i think that's kind of what i'm going to mainly focus on here oh yeah before we crack into it if you do have your own suggestion or something you'd really like me to check out i make sure to hit up patreon.com forward slash jbf music but uh, for this one, they are in a drop tuning, and I have busted out my, my kind of more metal guitar, which still has things I need to do to it, but I've not found the time to do, so hopefully it'll work well enough. I'm not cut out for the duration of recording here. But cool, uh, let's start as we always do at the start. So before we do that, this is the analysis thing. If you just want to kind of watch through and a general reaction, you can get out with the eye up there. This is the more kind of in-depth, breaking stuff down, pausing a lot type of video. Okay. So the intro here was kind of like almost a party piece where there's quite a bit of tapping going on. Let's go for that. So this is a very tangentially related to... So I mentioned Racer X in um, the previous video and that was kind of Paul Gilbert's band that kind of showcased his shredding. Um, I still maintain that Second Heat is one of the best guitar albums just made playing with him and Bruce. I think he pronounced his second name Bruce Boye. They harmonise the stuff that's just insane back in like, uh, like, like 86 or something they were doing it. I wouldn't rank it as like a, a kind of classic album because I don't think that the songwriting is you know, as strong as it is on like if you take Master of Puppets or something like that. But in terms of just guitar work, blistering solos and just kind of tasteful shred, I just just a personal favourite of mine. But after Racer X, Paul Gilbert went on to play Mr. Big, so you might know the kind of pop song to be with you. The guy that plays the acoustic guitar and does the little solo, which is basically just the vocal line with like a little harmonic thrown in. That's Paul Gilbert. Uh, good songwriter. He's got chops for days. He just comes across as a very humble, nice dude. And there's quite a transformation from his being the kind of the shredder with the, the poodle perm to slowly becoming the guy that wears his glasses and, you know, his suit and lives in, in Portland. So <laughs> quite the transition from LA to Portland. And I've gone on for so long on this little side tangent, I've forgotten what my original thing was. That was it. <laughs> um, Scott Travis, who played in Racer X, who's been the drummer for Judas Priest since Painkiller, so 1990 maybe. So you know that big mad drum fill at the start of the Painkiller. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can check out with the eye up there. Um, I, that kind of reminded me of that a little bit, so very tangentially uh, related. But I suppose Scarified starts off with the, the drums as well. So in particular, there is a song called Scarified by Racer X, and there's bits um, in this song, Clang by Bandmade, that I think are kind of paying homage to. So starting off with the drums is one. So here when we've got the tapping section, uh, Billy Sheehan played with Paul Gilbert in Mr. Big. Uh, Billy Sheehan? Yeah, Sheehan. Um, and this is the sort of thing they do a lot. He did it with Steve Vai as well. They do um, unison tapping parts, so the bass is tapping one thing, the guitar is tapping, usually the same thing but an octave higher. Sometimes they harmonise, sometimes they weave in and out of each other. But you can find a lots of stuff in that and they're, they're kind of live uh, performances in particular. There's a show that I think it might be like a farewell one they did in Tokyo. 
where there's quite a lot of tapping in it. I think it's that one in particular. <laughs> And even that line, there is a there's a Paul Gilbert song, Mr. Big song called Green Tinted Sixties Mind. Again, I will link to link to the breakdown of how to do the lick up there. This is it's, it's quite a complicated lick, but this has got um, although it's just kind of three notes, it does actually have an oddly similar vibe. <laughs> Maybe on the other string then. Yeah, so tapping's basically just hit a fret with your right hand and it means you can get quite a lot of speed on it. So this kind of rhythm. What they're doing, the guitarist among us has got a 12th fret on the G down to the 5th and to the 7th. I am in drop. C sharp. So everything's down a tone and then the low string's dropped. No, everything's down a semitone and then the low string is dropped down a semitone from there. So we don't have much harmonic information here, but I'm assuming this is basically like a what would be a G. I'm in a different tuning, I can't do the maths to work it out. G flat, is it that simple? It might be. Uh, but there's a note in it that which is the, the fourth degree of the scale. So I think I said sus four in the reaction and that's what I mean by that. There's a extra note in the card. If you've watched these videos before you'll probably have heard it. It's that thing that sounds a little bit jazzy, a little bit spacey, maybe a little bit borderline hippie or psychedelic. Cool, and before I kind of forget to mention it with tapping, muting the strings is quite an important part of it as well. So you can see here the thumb's kind of just resting probably on this low string. This finger over the top will be muting these. If you don't mute stuff and you tap, you get a lot of unwanted string noise, which is just the strings ringing out because you hit them by mistake, because that's just kind of what happens. So if you use this finger to mute these strings here, the kind of, what were the G, B and the E, your thumb to kind of come over the top and rest just very lightly on these lower strings. All you've really got to worry about is the what was the D string, and you can actually use the tip of your first finger to mute that out. So if I kind of strum this, I'm hitting all the strings, but you're only hearing this G because this first finger is muting these strings. What were the E and the B? And um, between my thumb, it's kind of I'm getting a harmonic there. There we go, I just did it a little bit more. My thumb's kind of taking care of those lower strings and, as they say, the tip of this finger taking care of the D, so all you're really going to hear is that G string. And that's a huge part to making tapping sound a bit cleaner. It's this Zen thing of guitar where it's not just the note that you want to play, you want to make sure all the other notes aren't sounding out as well. That's a huge step into get thing, getting things sounding a bit more kind of like kind of professional or a bit crisper. You can use stuff like a noise gate to help out as well, so there's always that as an option. Yeah, so they're doing a kind of a call and response here and then I think they double up. Play the same thing. A little chromatic tap. Yeah, so they're playing the same line. Then I slide up to nowhere. That's that was a cool, nice little touch. So basically, when you're tapping, you slide off the fretboard. Very 80s thing to do, but very cool sounding. Tell you what, I will actually explain what a noise gate is just now. If you bear with me one second. So I have here in my patch that I'm using a, a, a noise gate, which I've already got set up a little bit. If I turn it off entirely, you can hear there's a bit of kind of background noise anyway. A ton of string noise. What the noise gate is going to do is kind of, if a noise is particularly quiet, it's going to just go, it's going to gate it, it's going to stop it from coming through. So there's a few settings here, you've got the threshold, the ratio, the attack and release and the level. Levels if I want to make it louder from here, I don't really want to. Attack is how quickly the noise gate attacks the note, how quickly it affects the sound. Release is how quickly it releases the note, it kind of you know, let, lets it go back to how it was. The ratio is kind of how severe, uh, how much you want it to do stuff. And the threshold is the threshold at which it starts acting. So it's all 
somewhat intuitive. So say I put the threshold up at like here, which is relatively high, nothing really happens until I start moving the ratio. And I'm just moving this hand. If we move the ratio all the way up, the threshold all the way up, there's gonna be like no noise. Even if I even I strum the guitar really hard and nothing's coming through. So you need to find a kind of sweet spot where like see here it's muting everything. If I move these down, bring noise again, right? So modern metal tends to use quite a brutal You could probably even get away with more than that, because you get this really tight, kind of crisp. There's no string noise, no kind of you could call them transients or something like that. Nothing like that. Um generally speaking, what I tend to do is kind of just do this a little bit. And then when it starts to kind of go away, this is a this is a very high output pickup I've got in here. So Need, need, need to noise gate this a little bit more. So something like that, where it's coming up a little bit, but not much. And it, it means it's just a wee bit cleaner. When you're playing, you don't have to worry about open strings quite as much. Uh, it's also better to put a slightly slower attack. It just sounds a bit more natural and still like a kind of quick release. So if you combine kind of good muting practices and I've covered a kind of top 10 muting tips lesson so I'll link to that there with these kind of effects which is what you generally do live you'll have a noise gate on your pedal board that's how you can kind of keep things crisp and kind of polished sounding okay so this riff here it reminds me a bit more of there is a Paul Gilbert or Racer X song called Street Lethal and it's it's not identical, but it feels quite similar. That this like could be a Paul Gilbert riff that uh, Konami's playing here, and those bam bam bam, the kind of eighties diet. So I pre-prepared this one so you don't have to sit and listen through me <laughs> try to figure it out. But it was something like, oh, well, I say that now, I've completely forgotten it. Right. So if I actually just um, kind of and my terrible sign off there, you'll you'll find out what I mean if you stick around to the end. But it popped into my head when I played this riff. It's a, it's an Incubus song. <laughs> Which might be... It might be Circles. And it's that same idea. So it's this, um, which is kind of a, th a theme throughout this uh, song for me, modernizing things a bit. I, I mean, Incubus are like, what, a 90s band? I still think of them as being modern. That, to me, is still fairly fresh. <laughs> Type of sound. Like Rage Against the Machine, it's almost kind of timeless in a way. Anyway, there'll probably be an awkward edit before and after this. Uh, so uh, good luck, Future Jack. Okay, something like that. So, live here, I think she's using quite a bit of legato and hammer-ons to do it. Paul, the Paul Gilbertian approach would be to pick notes a bit more. Um, it might just be because it's live, she's doing that. She might have done that way in the studio. I'd need to kind of listen closer to the studio version, double check it. But you've got this kind of... Um, what would be the way to describe it? Like a kind of chunky part of the riff. And then the kind of full part. So the way I'm playing this, you might want to double check it, but I'm in the aforementioned tuning. Open 3-5, which is a... I'm doing this a hammer on here because I think that's how she's doing it. So I hit the string once, hammering those. Then 5 on what was the A string. And then you've got a similar thing with the open 3-5 on the low string. I'm going to slide this time, so you do a position shift. So you've got... Then... Uh, five to seven on that A string, then we're gonna go. So you've got after the slide eight to ten on what was the A string up to seven, eight, ten on the D string and pull off, so a bit more slowly. And the second time starts off the same. And then you've got these kind of um, scratches, so just muted hits. Five and six on G and B strings, or whatever the G and the B strings. 
and down to five and five, and down to three, and these. Those uh, dyads, it's a fancy way of saying two notes that you play at the same time, right? Those are very 80s and very Paul Gilbert. In particular, if you go and have a listen to, as I say, Scarified and Street Lethal, those are um, just, just very, very Gilbertian things to do, right? So the way, if it was a Paul Gilbert one, how would it differ? There's a pattern that Paul Gilbert used uh, a lot, particularly in his, his first album with Racer X. So that would be, for example, uh, 7, 8, 10 on the A string and then just hammering on and pulling off 7 to 10 on the D. So you'd maybe do a big run and then end a kind of lick like that. So he might have played something like um, along those lines. So it's a bit sloppy, but just if it would be like 5, 7, 8, it's in drop D, which isn't a... Uh, this the strings lower, which isn't common for Paul Gilbert. So five, seven, eight on both strings, and then I'm gonna go seven, eight, ten, seven, eight, ten, seven, eight, ten again, and then a little trill on the D. So sorry, I should have explained that better. Going from the low string to here, the A string, play it again, and then do that. So slowly, you'd have some like. Uh, he also does tricks where he wouldn't pick every note, so he might hammer on the first three, pick the next three, kind of rotate doing that. I've done a more in-depth lesson on that you can get with the eye up there. But you can hear there's a kind of similar, uh, similarity, that kind of, that kind of ending, right? And then, well, Paul Gilbert is known for his string skips, and if I have any cards left, I'll link to what I'm talking about with there. They would do pauses in uh, Racer X, and Scarified in particular, um, just at the end of the solos, I think, before it goes back into the main theme. There's like a little lick he does, it pauses and it goes down, and we, if we watch here, that's what happens. More or less, it's like a kind of show. The drums are stabbing along, so I missed that the first time there. But it's kind of a showcase little diddle for the guitar. The difference, of course, <laughs> when the vocals come in, it's much more tasteful than someone just going, yeah! <laughs> you know, <laughs> doing the, some sort of a stupidly high note with loads of rasp on it. So what's kind of interesting here is they've taken that kind of 80s kind of shred style, and then it's kind of shifting into more, I wouldn't even call this 90s, but just kind of contemporary rock sound. Um, so I, I'll need to check when they did this in their career because it's reminded me like Thrill was kind of like a slightly kind of Guns N' Roses-y thing for me um, and it wouldn't surprise me if this was kind of done near the start of their kind of songwriting but I, I, I don't know so I'll need to check it out or you guys if you can tell me in the comments as well that'd be helpful Right so there's a part coming up in here uh, oh, right. just this bit that rhythm, even that uh, in Scarified is the rhythm that's played under the solo section. So when Paul Gilbert does this by himself without another guitarist, he'll kind of do 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 the rhythm that's underneath, which again is similar to this. It'd be interesting to see um, if they've ever done any interviews and if there is indeed a, like a, what do you call it, a homage to it, if they've never even heard of Racer X, which they probably did because Paul Gilbert was quite big in Japan. Um, or if it's just like that, you know, like I mentioned before, the always sunny music conspiracy mind map of things filtering through, kind of through the zeitgeist or osmosis or whatever you want to call it. In fairness, the rhythm is slightly different, but it's got a similar kind of accent to it. And just thinking there, um, Scarified is downtuned as well. I think it's in D standard. Cool, and the, well, the chorus is quite band madey, as you know, <laughs> it's their their own genre. There is a still a distinctly eighties flavour with the the chord progression. And before I forget to mention, um, I think his name's Juan Alder Alderetti or Aldernetti, who played bass in Racer X, went on to play bass in the Mars Volta and other things as well. So it was a really, I think that the singer plays drums in Badlands, so I don't really know much about. But it's just a really. Um, talented set of musicians who've you know done pretty cool things after it but if we listen to this the 
So that's basically the um, thing we have from the other riff, but backwards. And again, it's these dyads, these two notes together that are very 80s. And this is the thing they like to do. They've gone to like a slightly spicy um, chord that you wouldn't you wouldn't have really got in the kind of eighties kind of glam hair metal, but it just adds a, a kind of slightly more modern edge to to the song. It puts their own stamp on it. Is that a strap adjustment there? Let's check that. Yeah. So this is this is the perils of wearing a, a maid costume. It looked there like a strap had maybe got stuck under, I don't know what you call it, the kind of bow thing that she's wearing there. And this is something I hadn't thought about. Um, if you're wearing stage outfits, there are going to be kind of uh, occupational hazards where you know, a strap or like a wireless pack or a lead gets tangled up in your apparel. There's another kind of interesting chord here, passing one. There. So what this is, is a kind of uh, classical rising bass line. If I've got any cards left, I'll link to what happens there. I believe there was a Love Bite song that used it. Um, it's the same idea. And again, it's something you wouldn't necessarily have got in the kind of 80s music that sounded a bit like this, like your Motley Crue or kind of Rat or those kind of bands, Skid Row. Um, you, maybe Malmsteen would have used it, and it would maybe pop up in more kind of ballady things, I suppose. And yeah, just going for a much kind of heavier break there, really, aren't they? It's almost like a balancing act where they're doing like a nod to kind of more old school stuff, but then still keeping it contemporary. And like here, for example, um, the drums have gone to doing a kind of tom, kind of fill type thing, instead of keeping it as a standard beat. And it again, it just adds a slightly different context to the music. I will say as well, it's really cool that um, the live clips I've seen from them before have been the kind of uh, like official live ones, and you have a lot of uh, leeway when you're doing that to to touch things up and kind of polish things. And if you're releasing it as like a a single or as like a showcase. It's, you know, as long as you're honest about it, as long as you go, we've kind of touched things up a bit, I think that's I think that's kind of okay. Um, here you can tell it's still really good musicianship. The only thing I will say is the backing vocals are sometimes not uh, totally in pitch. It's just a tiny bit, and if it isn't something that I'd like regularly paid attention to as like a musician person, I probably wouldn't even notice. But it's, it's just great to see that there's still that, uh, that kind of level of, you know, quality. Because in, in the, the digital age of the internet, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that you can't hide behind, you know? Speaking of which, and point, you know, you point one finger, four point back at you, um, I edit a ton out of these videos where I just kind of go off on a tangent or it takes me a while to work something out or slop my way through a riff or something like that. It just gets straight to the chopping room floor. So even something as simple as this, there's a lot of stuff that just gets gets <laughs> pushed out. Well, that's cool. This is something I hadn't noticed before. Um, probably because it's more like a gorilla style video, but if you look at Misa's cabinet there, it looks like, is that a four? Might still be a four by 12. So I think there's still four speaker cones in that cabinet. It's got her, I'm talking about the speaker she's playing through, right? She's got the head on top, which is amplifier that makes it sound the speaker. And rather than having another speaker underneath, like two 4x12 caps, which is very loud and somewhat unnecessary in, in the modern age where you can get a lot of noise from quite small equipment, which you couldn't back in the 60s or 70s, she's got on top of a flight case. So flight case is what you put stuff in to protect it. So that looks like it's maybe for the cab, maybe for the head. Um, and the reason she's got up there is if you think about the height, it's closer, a lot closer to ear level, so it's maybe at her kind of shoulder level, so if she's kind of leaning down a bit, it'll be close to her ears. If it's down here, the sound is just getting projected at your legs, so it makes things a lot more difficult to hear, particularly if it's bass, which because it's a low frequency, it's quite hard to hear the pitch of. 
So if you ever go to a gig and you see uh, an amplifier that's on a chair or something like that, a lot of the time that's why, it's because it's easier to hear. And particularly if you're, if it's a small show and you're not really micing anything up, if you have amplifiers higher, the sound is going to project further because it's not just hitting into the back of everyone's legs or hitting the first person in the audience. It's going to kind of carry over the top. So as well as them having, you know, in-ears and the, the wedges here, these kind of big blocks, there'll be sound coming back through that. There's practical things you can do, like just putting your cabinet higher so you can hear it a bit better. Not, it, not as necessary with guitar, it does help, but it's much more so with bass. If it's up at a ear level, it's much easier to hear. Cool, uh, so the solo is nothing like Paul Gilbert, and when I said before uh, she was following the chords, there's one note in particular you can hear, and a spicy note. Dun, dun. Sounds like they've gone to the, the five chord, and she'd be playing the, uh, the third from the five chord. It sounds like nonsense, but it's a sound you might recognise from you know, blues and stuff like that, but this, this is kind of a more metal application of the same idea. It's not a Paul Gilbert solo in, in the slightest there. There might have been a wee fluff note there, I'm not entirely sure if that's what the solo's like or not. Other practical things you'll notice at the far side of the stage, unless I've mistakenly cropped it off, I'm sure I'll just move the video if I haven't. At a fan. Quite self-explanatory, but it can get very warm. I particularly imagine if you're wearing like a lot of clothes, they look fairly light, the kind of uh, outfits that they wear. But it just gets warm when there's stage lights. Having a fan to cool things down is just almost essential, really. On that note, you can see on top of Miku's amplifier, there's a towel. Again, sweaty hands make it very difficult to play. Rub them off, you could as new. The other thing is as well, you can get sweat in unexpected places. So like see here on your guitar, because your arms rest in there. It's a particularly warm gig. Well, for me anyway, that bit always gets kind of sweaty. Um, and if you use it as a re reference point, an anchor point, <laughs> you, can, you can slip. So as well as like your hands and the back of the guitar neck, because your hands are touching that, wiping down there can be a useful thing to do as well. And it's something that you don't always notice until it's too late. So it's good to get in the habit of giving things a quick wipe down just to cover all bases. And obviously bottles of water, even hydrated. In an ideal world, actually, <laughs> this is really stupid, but you know those like uh, kind of sports bottles you get where you can just kind of squeeze it and the water comes out? I can't remember what the top's called, the kind of nozzle around the screw cap. Those are good because you can just kind of bite the top off and squish it in and pop it back down. You don't have to unscrew it. Whereas um, if you're trying to do a quick uh, like a tight set and not have much messing about in between songs, something as stupid as opening a bottle, it, it, it can go wrong. <laughs> and then you have to screw it back on before the song's done or risk it falling over. Particularly if it's on top of an amplifier, you don't want that happening. The water and electronics is just not, not a good mix. <laughs> Cool. I've got a bandmate staple there where they kind of go in half time. Yep. Cool, and this final chorus here, right? There's a cool bit where it stops and you just get the vocals. Back in, a nice little slide on the guitar as a kind of precursor to everything kicking back in. Lovely little touches just to make certain things pop a bit more. But again, you know, you don't always catch this stuff on the first time, if at all. Back down to that kind of cool riff, the main kind of theme of the song. Cool, and that's quite a Paul Gilberty thing going to a kind of faster bit to wrap it up as well.
Like, I think the end of Scarified has that. I think after the big string skipped arpeggio harmonized bit goes do 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 and that's a dead stop. I might be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it does. So, uh, a total departure again from what's become the kind of norm for these videos. So, I hope that made enough sense and you enjoyed it. There's, there's just uh, there's so much going on, uh, kind of musically, and also just th this one was cool because you can really see because it's one angle and it's not chopping about. You can actually see the stage and what they've got going on. Like I think there's like some sort of uh, stuffed animal toys underneath the the amp head there, which um, if there's a smoke machine going at this gig and most of their gigs, they'll they'll start to smell after a while. That smell of smoke does does stick in things, and I can see the kind of collection of whiskies up on the, the the base as well there. I wouldn't leave a whiskey there uh, because the top of a, an amp head generally gets a bit warm and a warm whiskey is, is not is, is not a nice thing. It also looks like it might be Jack Daniels so I'm not too sure how much how much I approve of this. Yeah, well, once again, a huge cheers to Rabbi Rouse for kind of suggesting this song and also clocking the interesting kind of scarified Paul Gilbert uh, parallels running through it. If you yourself have something you want me to check out, make sure to hit up Patreon. You can do the old subscribe or these, click on these videos and the likes and the comments and all that stuff is fantastic. Worst sign off ever, but I'm just going with it. So, <laughs> have a good one, guys.